We've talked already about all the reasons why Shein is just like destroying all of the big fast fashion brands right now. There's the virtually infinite assortment. You know, Shein has about 600,000 styles. 600,000, that's so many zeros. Is that many styles available for purchase on its site every single day? And it launches 6,000 new items daily. It also has extended sizing. And we can agree that Shein's fit is not great. And in conversations I've had with those who have shopped from Shein, I've learned that the sizing is way off and inconsistent, particularly in the plus sizes. The reality is that everyone deserves better than Shein. And it makes me so angry that this, this is the best option for so many people because the rest of the clothing industry ignores them. Another thing that Shein has going for it is convenience. Okay, so 600,000 items to choose from and I don't have to leave my couch to buy them. And they're super fast shipping. Remember all of those airplanes from last week's episode? I mean, you don't get much easier, more convenient than basically access to everything or so it feels without leaving your house. But the biggest advantage that Shein has over every regular old fast fashion retailer out there is price. And most conversations that are sort of like in defense of Shein always come back to the price, how it's more accessible than any other brand out there. And you know, as I said in last week's episode, I've never bought anything from Shein. That's not a humble brag. I just, I just haven't. But I've heard so much about the low, low prices. So I decided to look for myself. Like just how low are Shein's prices that everybody is opting for them? And what I can see is like not really great product based on what I see at the thrift stores. Like if those prices are so low, like how low are they, right? Like how great of a deal is she in? So I went to the website and immediately I was greeted by some banners offering me several different deals. It was automatically kind of like overwhelming. The first one said I could get free shipping and a 20% off coupon for my first order. Then there was another little like block of content that said if I used this coupon code, I could get 10% off of a $69 order, 15% off of a $109 order, or 20% off a $189 order. But I could also join the Shein Club and get 5% off more than 100,000 items. Sorry, uh, just saying 100,000 items gives my eco-anxiety like a big kick in the butt. I had to take a moment there. Uh, I also, when I joined the Shein Club, could get free shipping coupons. So there's a complex deal structure going on here, which you already know if you've been listening to Clothes Horse for a long time is like one of fast fashion's tricks to get you to buy more stuff, right? And, and it works, right? And it's definitely working for Shein. Anyway, I figured I would look at dresses since that's, you know, an area of personal interest to me as a person who doesn't wear pants. So I clicked on dresses and I sorted by price high to low. I wanted to know how many dresses Shein offered under $10. And I got to say, immediately I was shocked with so many dresses that were priced under $5, $5. We're talking $4.36, $4.25, $2.35, $2.20. I don't even think I could get a coffee at a gas station for $2.20. So like I said, I was wondering how many dresses Shein had under $10. So I started counting. I stopped counting when I reached 450 because, you know, eventually this episode needs to be finished, but it seemed as if I was several pages of dresses away from reaching that $10 threshold. I'm going to tell you that anyone who has made clothes, whether literally by cutting them and sewing them or in the more businessy sense, like me as a buyer, well, any of us who have been involved with the making of clothes can't help but be shocked by these prices because they just don't make sense. Like, let's think about it for a minute. First, we have to think about the obvious costs. Fabrics, trims, zippers, hook and eyes, buttons, lining, etc. 
I mean, I don't even want to think about it. I know what it is. It's a really low quality synthetic fabric. That's the answer to the question I'm about to ask you rhetorically. What kind of fabric are you using if you can make a profit off of a dress selling for $220? Or you're selling that dress for $180 if a new user like me gets that 20% discount. $1.80 for a dress. Okay, so we got that. We got the, like the really noticeable elements of a dress that we have to pay for. But then there are the things we often don't notice that do cost money, like the labels inside that say the brand name and the size and the care instructions and the fabric content. They cost money to make and they cost money to sew in. It's often 10 to 25 cents, even more if you're a smaller brand. Some of the smaller brands I work with, it's two, three, four, even $5 for all of that. But there's also the actual cutting and the sewing and the inspection and the packing of that garment. In the world of fast fashion, the people doing all of those tasks, they make at best 4% of the selling price. So all of those people involved in making a dress for $2.20, they're sharing eight cents for their work on that. I don't wanna go to hardcore clothes horse right out of the gate, but you know, we have a saying around here. And that saying is, it's cheap because someone didn't get paid. And in this case, how is anyone getting paid? Like, I just, how's the fabric mill getting paid for that fabric? Like, the math just doesn't math. But there's even more involved in the cost of a garment normally. There are fit samples and design and production team salaries, duties, taxes, shipping, packaging, marketing costs, company overhead, on and on and on. And when we buy clothes from a regular fast fashion brand, we are paying for all of those things. None of this makes sense with a $58 dress from Urban Outfitters. And it certainly doesn't make sense with a $10 dress or one that costs $2.20. Shein prices are artificially low, unnaturally low, unethically low. I'm sure you're figuring that out by now. In last week's episode, we talked about how Shein has two major advantages working in its favor in comparison to the rest of the regular fast fashion brands. For one, it ships directly from the factory. So the company doesn't have the overhead expenses of warehouses, stores, and the staff that fills them. Number two, it doesn't pay duties on the orders it ships into the United States, which makes it easy to charge super low prices that regular retailers cannot and can never offer. Remember this little nugget from last week? According to the companies themselves, Shein and Timu paid a grand total of $0 in import taxes in 2022. For reference, During the same year, Gap paid $700 million in import duty, while H&M paid $205 million. As a buyer, those duties were part of the cost structure of an item, and they're not insignificant. A polyester dress, which is most definitely what you're getting from Shein for $2.20, well, polyester dress, if you're paying duties on what you're importing, which big retailers are, remember Shein is not, The polyester dress has a duty of 32% of its value. So let's say a dress costs $8 to make in China. And that's a pretty standard fast fashion price right there. That $8 covers the fabric, the sewing, all of the things we discussed earlier. And yeah, that is also scandalous to me. And that's $8, not $2.20. A retailer imports that $8 dress into the U.S., And that 32% duty will add another $2.56 to the cost of that dress, which the retailer will pass on to you as part of the retail price. Shein doesn't have to do that. So that's another reason it can offer prices that are unnaturally low. These are some major factors in Shein's unnaturally low prices, but it's more than that. It's stealing designs. It's avoiding legal repercussions. It's skipping things like product testing for safety. It's horrible working conditions in its factories. 
It's maybe even forced labor. We know, all of us, in our heart of hearts, even if we've never sewn a garment in our lives, that these prices don't make sense. Even if we don't know a thing about duties or garment workers or overseas shipping, these prices are too cheap to be true. But many of us compartmentalize it and make the purchase anyway. Or we tell ourselves, it's different over there, or it's cheaper because it's shipping from the factory. Maybe we don't tell ourselves anything at all because it's too difficult to let ourselves open that door in our minds. Because we live in a society that tells us we need a lot of new clothes. Not that we want a lot of new clothes, that we need, need a lot of new clothes. That society tells us that we have to dress a certain way to be successful, whether that's socially, professionally, or even romantically. We live in a world that tells us every day that something or many things about us is a problem area that can be remedied or disguised by this shirt or those jeans. We're told that we need to look young and not poor, thin, on trend, and sexy, but not too sexy. And the only way to achieve that is by buying more and more stuff. Of course, we're going to try not to question a $2.20 dress because we need to survive, right? So, you know, I really struggle with anxiety now as an adult, but also as a child. I can't remember a time when I wasn't feeling at least a little sick with anxiety. Even now as I'm recording this, my stomach is churning about something random. I've definitely gotten better at managing it, but it still is something I deal with every day. Even clothes horse, while a nice distraction from my daily fretting, is also a source of a lot of anxiety for me. I mean, have you been on social media lately? It's brutal. As a kid... When I didn't know that this worrying and fear, like that it had a name, I also knew it wasn't worth discussing with anyone. It was my job to figure out how to deal with it. I mean, we were not a family that leaned into mental health care. I can tell you that. I have this very specific memory of just laying in my bedroom. I was about seven, I want to say. Back then, we lived in this trailer out in the country. It was part of a trailer park. And I had my favorite bedroom of my childhood. I often wasn't involved in decorating choices, including decorating choices for my own bedroom. And my mom was not a huge fan of my ideal pastel lifestyle. But somehow for this room, I'd been allowed to pick out the wallpaper at this sort of like scratch and dent liquidation outlet for home stuff. My mom was totally trying to steer me toward a beige geometric pattern. Of course she was. My mom loved beige. Every room was a different shade of beige. Her furniture was a shade of beige. There was just beige to be found everywhere in our house. I'm pretty sure my mom wore beige eyeshadow. And I was laughing to myself a couple days ago because I read an article about how millennials have really settled into gray being the color that they use to decorate and buy furniture in and just like in generally lean into. And I was like, wow, maybe beige was the gray of like boomers. I don't know, but I just thought it was interesting because beige was a recurring theme in our home. Even our towels were beige. So Here we are at this liquidation warehouse outlet place. My mom's trying to get me to get some beige wallpaper. And I'm digging around in this pile. It's like a bin. And I see this gleaming white roll of wallpaper. It was like the clouds separated and a little beam of light from heaven shone on it. White roll with a pastel rainbow pattern. Are you sure, my mom asked. You'll hate that when you're a teenager. And spoiler, I'll just say I would not have hated that as a print as a teenager, but I might have been embarrassed because it wouldn't reflect my 70s grungy aesthetic that, like, of that time. But I probably would have still kind of secretly loved it and maybe just like covered it with posters and just occasionally like peeled away the breeders or Nirvana just, just to have a glimpse of it and feel happy about it because I loved that wallpaper. 
Maybe I knew by then that I would always love pastel rainbows because I, in fact, still love pastel rainbows. Or perhaps I already understood that we would never stay anywhere for very long. So we certainly wouldn't be there in that trailer with me sleeping in that room by the time I was a teenager. I mean, seriously, by then at age seven, I'd already gone to four schools and lived in probably like a dozen homes. I was trying to remember them all today and they were running together. Lots of apartments, a couple trailers. There was a brief time we were living with my grandma. We were all over the place. So yeah, that wallpaper, it's time in my life may have been fleeting, but it brought me a kind of joy and peace. Like this was my room. Finally, a room that was really mine. When I was worrying too much, I would sit on the floor and just stare at the rainbows and zone out. And it made me feel calmer. It stopped the anxiety spiral. But one night, this memory that I'm sharing with you, it was one of those annoying summer nights where you have to go to bed because bedtime is at 8.30, but... I don't know if you're familiar with this phenomenon. It's still light outside. It's so unfair. To make matters worse, you can hear other kids outside having fun. So it's like already kind of an upsetting time. You're definitely not going to fall asleep because it's not dark in your room. So I'm laying there thinking, kind of semi-faking being asleep in case my mom looks in. I was thinking about a boy I knew from school, or rather, I knew his sister from school, he had leukemia, so we had been doing all kinds of bake sales and walkathons to raise money for his treatment. After all, this is the US where an illness will bankrupt your family. It felt like he had been sick since I was in kindergarten, and now it was the summer between second and third grades, and it just seemed like he would always be sick, but he would still be around. He was my brother's age, and you know, they would end up graduating together. But that didn't happen because he died that summer. And I was in bed that night really worrying about it. It seemed like bad things happened to innocent people all the time. I watched the nightly news with my grandpa, so I knew I knew about wars and bombs on airplanes and hijackings and tornadoes, earthquakes, and so many other nightmares. I had spent a few months that year obsessing over the Titanic, and I knew that many people had died a terrifying death and others had had to cope with the nightmare of surviving it for the rest of their lives. Seriously, for reasons I cannot understand, my family was letting me read an entire book about the sinking of the Titanic. And it was it was really, really intense. It was a book for adults, not a children's book, and it was brutal. I believe it was called A Night to Remember, but I'm not I'm not sure. Anyway, I knew that all kinds of unfair things were happening all the time. And often these things were scary and often they were random, which made them scarier and more unfair. So I was laying in bed that night, hearing the kids that lived in the trailer across from ours playing on their slip and slide, which by the way, we were not allowed to use because my mom said it was dangerous. They're having fun and I'm just laying there. And I found myself worrying about my brother dying of leukemia or or maybe me because I had already had cancer once And it seemed likely that more bad things could happen to me. I worried about being on a boat that sank, a plane that fell out of the sky, maybe being at the beach when a tsunami rolled in. How could I, how could I be expected to survive in such a terrifying world? I stared at those pastel rainbows on my wallpaper, always so joyful and positive, they lived in a world where bad things never happened. You know, why, why couldn't I live there too? And I decided something. I decided that, you know, all of those bad things that happened, they weren't real. They hadn't happened to real people. They were just stories for all of us real people. We were supposed to learn from them and be grateful for our lives. But those things weren't really happening. Like no one was being hurt. The people who seemed to be hurt, the boy whose sister I went to school with who died, he'd never been real. Just something I'd been told about. I told myself this over and over again. And well, wouldn't you know, if you tell yourself something often enough, it becomes a fact to you. And I used this to comfort myself for years, long after we had moved away from that trailer with its most perfect wallpaper. 
one day, and I don't know when this happened specifically, I must have realized that it wasn't true, but it helped me survive for so long. It gave me one less thing to worry about. It allowed me to just live life and grow up, honestly, have the energy to grow up. There are so many things happening in this world right now, at this exact moment that I am recording this, this exact moment that you are listening to this. There are so many things happening that are terrible. And if we sat down and forced ourselves to witness all of them right now, I don't know how we would get up and live another day or do the laundry or go to work, take out the recycling, pay the electric bill. And that includes the reality of many of the things we buy, wear, and use. The stories behind them are bad. Some, some are worse than others. We know that fast fashion is bad. The microplastics, the carbon footprint, the water pollution, the horrible conditions under which these things are made, the rotting clothes in the Atacama Desert in Chile or the beaches in Accra, Ghana. We know that these things are bad and sometimes we bear witness to them. But we also have to survive our lives. We have to be friends and partners and coworkers and mothers and neighbors. We have to get up every day and keep living. And in a world where we have to dress a certain way in order to fit in, to be respected and maybe succeed, sometimes, sometimes we just have to stare at the rainbow wallpaper and tell ourselves a story to make us worry less about what we are about to buy, even when the prices just don't make sense at all. My hope with this series is that you, people you talk about this with, people you share it with, We'll take that moment to walk away from the wallpaper and bear witness and think about what happens next because it's important. It's important for all of us to stop denying that these things happen and recognize that the repercussions are real. At the same time, we have to protect ourselves and live life, right? And that balance is really hard. So if this becomes difficult for you to listen to or think about, take a break, but don't take a permanent break. Don't be seven-year-old me saying, oh, this is all fiction. This doesn't really happen. But live with that information and make decisions based on it. And get ready to fight for some change. Welcome to Close Source, the podcast that is still talking about Shein. I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 205, part two in a short series I'm calling The Shein Sotes, because yes, I am a cheese ball. If you haven't listened to part one yet, go do that, because it really sets up a lot of the things I'm going to mention in this installment, and you'll just feel smarter and more involved in what we're talking about. So go do that. This will be here when you come back. In this episode, we're going to continue to explore just how Shein can charge those unnaturally, unethically low prices and how its success could have a very bad halo effect on just about everything we buy, along with our wages and jobs, no matter where we work or what we do. We'll be discussing the following, how Shein's Byzantine corporate structure virtually shields it from any legal accountability. Shein is infamous for stealing designs from artists and smaller brands, and also big brands, believe it or not. So how is it doing that? And how the way Shein runs its business could be endangering its customers, along with the people making its product. And that's just the beginning. We're going to talk about a lot today. (laughs) Before we get started, as a reminder, Shein's growth and impending IPO are a bad thing for everyone on this planet. We're not picking on Shein when we talk about the ethical and environmental issues related to its business model. We think that the entire business model of fast fashion is bad news and we criticize it pretty regularly. Um, We're not being xenophobic when we talk about Shein. We're not talking about Shein because it is primarily based in China. 
Uh, we're talking about it because Shein is changing what it means to make and sell clothing. We're not shaming people for shopping from Shein. If you're wearing Shein clothes right now or you just placed an order, it doesn't matter. You're a part of this community and we're glad you're here. We're talking about Shein because its success is pushing the fashion industry to make clothing a lot faster and more quasi-disposable. It is making the problem of fast fashion much, much worse. One more thing before we jump in. I am once again reminding you of the Clothes Horse Jamboree. It is happening August 16th through 17th here in Lancaster, PA. Tickets are $200, but they're going up to $300 on July 1st, which is in a week. So buy your ticket now. And guess what? I have introduced a payment plan option that I'm calling Brenda Pay. Brenda loves installment plans. Each payment is $50 spread over four payments. The first one happens when you buy your ticket. You'll use promo code installment one at checkout. When you like enter your payment info, you'll be charged $50 and you'll receive your actual ticket via email immediately. Now, I'm going to send you a link to pay the remaining payments on 625, 725, and the week of the Jamboree. But if you are doing this this week, we need to talk and set up a slightly different cadence for your ticket payments. So we'll talk after you place your order. If you have questions, reach out to me via email. Otherwise, get your ticket now. The payment plan option will disappear on July 1st next week. If you're planning to come, but you're still trying to figure out the details, drop me an email and I will honor the $200 price through July for you. But I have to tell you, we're probably going to cut off ticket sales around July 15th because we need to order food and other things for the event. And we can't be doing that last minute or no one's going to have a good time. And we're probably going to have less options. So please reach out if you were planning to buy a ticket. Let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep Clothes Horse going via their generous Patreon support. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at dylanpagelifeandstyle. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. 
Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. Sagavan Vintage DTLV is a vintage clothing, accessories, and decor reselling business based in downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. Not only do we sell in Las Vegas, but we're also located throughout resale markets in San Francisco, as well as at a curated boutique called Lux and Ivy located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jessica, the founder and owner of Vagabond Vintage DTLV, recently opened the first IRL location located in the Arts District of downtown Las Vegas on August 5th. The shop has a strong emphasis on 60s and 70s garments, single stitch tees, and dreamy loungewear. Follow them on Instagram at Vagabond Vintage DTLV and keep an eye out for their website coming fall of 2022. Okay, let's get back to Sheehan. So where are we right now? Well, last week we talked about Sheehan's attempts at an IPO, otherwise known as an initial public offering, essentially becoming a publicly traded company. Sheehan was hoping to go public here in the U.S. on the New York Stock Exchange, where it could have received the maximum value on its shares. But experts are now saying that dream is officially dead, as SEC regulators, as well as members of Congress, think that Sheehan is a risky investment. Thanks to its environmental impact, its ties to forced labor, thanks to its murky at-best supply chain, and its ties to the Chinese government. Furthermore, its current corporate structure insulates it from a lot of financial risk, like paying duties or settling lawsuits, and that structure would change if the company became publicly traded. There is a direct correlation between all of these risks, the ties to forced labor, the environmental impact, the lack of duties, taxes, and legal responsibility. All of those things are directly connected to Sheehan's unnaturally low prices. Should the company become publicly traded, those prices will likely have to change, which makes investment even riskier because customers may decide to shop elsewhere. Sheehan has shifted gears and it's now trying to file its IPO in London. And it might happen because word on the street, I don't know, perhaps Wall Street, is that London is pretty desperate for the influx of money that a Sheehan IPO could bring in. It's also a much smaller market than the New York Stock Exchange. So this is sort of Sheehan settling for less money in its IPO. It wants that IPO, because then it will receive a massive influx of cash that will allow it to take huge leaps forward in terms of growth. But now sources are saying that the London IPO is kind of in regulatory limbo too for many of the same reasons it did not succeed in the US. Furthermore, there was a significant error in its initial filing for its IPO in London. What I'm about to read to you is from the South China Morning Post. I'll share the link in the show notes, as always, with many more links if you want to go check them out. The company's local entity, Xi'an Distribution UK, reached the law by failing to list a human as its, quote, person with significant control, PSC, in its filings to Company House, the National Corporate Registrar. The Guardian reported this in March. A month later, Sheehan changed its filing to say that it believes there is no registrable person or registrable, that's what the word is, it's really impossible to pronounce, registrable relevant legal entity in relation to the company. Okay, what the heck does all that mean? Well, a PSC or a person of significant control is someone who owns or controls a company. In the case of Sheehan, one would expect it to be the company's now billionaire founder, Chris Zhu. 
a PSC either holds more than 25% of the shares in the company or more than 25% of the voting rights in the company or has the right to appoint or remove the majority of the company's board or has the right to exercise significant control over a business. And in fact, many PSCs would have most of these as part of their running of this company. Once again, one would expect this to be the founder of Shein, but then again, the structure of Shein's business is, well, it's really complicated. We'll get to that in a few. But for people who were auditing this paperwork, something just felt off. Like, why wouldn't there be a person of significant control at the helm of Shein? Like, that's pretty weird especially because this company is so large, it's privately owned, its founder is still involved and seems to be still pulling all the strings. Wouldn't he be the person of significant control, the PSC? Well, if this was a mistake on the filing and it was like a genuine mistake, that's also a bit surprising for a company valued at more than $60 billion. Like they have the resources to hire someone detail-oriented to do that paperwork correctly. So this is making investors feel a bit weird. This is making regulators feel a bit weird. It's hard to know what will happen next, but private investors of the company who invested money in anticipation of making it all back times a lot more when the IPO happens are now getting nervous and they're asking for their money back. So this is a bad situation for Sheehan. Regardless of how this IPO works, Shein's success is making the rest of the publicly traded fast fashion brands and their investors very, very nervous. Last month, in my episode breaking down the question, is it classist to talk about fast fashion, I talked about a report released late last year, I want to say in December, by UBS Securities about Shein customers. This was the one that revealed that the average Shein customer is 34.7 years old and makes about $65,000 in income each year. Cue the predictable headlines. I really saw them of 34-year-olds should know better, and it turns out Shein customers aren't poor. There were just so many posts about this, and I was like, guys, like, this is a much more complex and nuanced thing than any of you are painting it to be, and I suppose... That's what social media is, right? Like you get points for outrage, uh, you get more engagement. And so like telling the full story would one, take more work and two, probably get less engagement because it wouldn't be as hot, I guess. But there were a lot of hot takes for this report that I just felt made conversations about Shein even worse actually for a while. So As I discussed in that episode about is it classist to talk about fast fashion, I have a few issues with this report and like kind of how it was interpreted. The researchers focused on 684 regular Shein customers, and that's not the biggest sample group in my opinion, especially when I know that at the end of 2022, the Shein app had 74.7 million total users worldwide. 684 people is just like a tiny little grain of sand, right? Next, as someone who is older than 34.7 years old, I will tell you that it is in fact not old. And beyond that, even if it was 44.7 or 64.7, Fast fashion is a problem for people of all ages. I think this just goes back to a lot of the ageist misconceptions people have about fast fashion, that it's for young, trendy people. Nope. And Taylor, Chico's, Anthropology, they are definitely fast fashion, and they cater to an older target customer. But also, Shein launches 6,000 new styles every day, so odds are very high they have stuff for the decrepit olds like me. Okay, next was that whole $65,300 in annual income thing. People on social media were like, I told you that Shein customers were rich. 
Well, as we talked about in the episode where we broke this down, an income of $65,300 might not even indicate that a person is making a living wage. Like if they live in Austin, Texas, where I used to live, that's only a living wage if they are unmarried and have no children. But also, what if they have student loan debt, medical bills, care for a family member? I'll tell you, $65,000 $65,000 sounded like a zillion dollars to me until I made $65,000. And then I was like, oh God, I'm still just getting by because I'm a single parent with student loans and I live in Portland, Oregon. It's not that much money and it doesn't really indicate someone's ability to pay for clothing, right? But there were some things about the study that I felt really indicate that Sheehan is a major problem for many fast fashion retailers. First, more and more customers are shifting their spending to Shein. We already know that, but the data backs it up. So while all the data that really made its way across social media about like spending habits and ages and incomes, that all focused on the 684 customers who identified themselves in the study as regular Shein customers, The study itself began with 4,000 American women. And in June 2020, when the study began, just 0.6% of the women said they bought clothing from Shein. That percentage rose to 2.5% by June 2022 and came in at 4% last year in 2023. Researchers were expecting that number would dip as people returned to in-person shopping, but no, they were choosing Shein over shopping IRL in an even bigger way. What else? Well, three out of 10 Shein shoppers here in the U.S. said they had shopped at TJ Maxx in the last three months, also a fast fashion brand. In other words, TJ Maxx should feel nervous about more customers migrating to Shein and skipping TJ Maxx altogether. These customers also said they shopped at Victoria's Secret, Macy's, Old Navy, Kohl's, Ross, American Eagle, and H&M. And guess what? When this report was released last December, all of these companies, except for TJ Maxx, were struggling with reduced sales and lower stock prices. And many continue to struggle. UBS said, the data also causes us to believe Shein is a major and increasing threat to U.S. specialty retailers. And that list includes urban outfitters, department stores, really any store at the mall or online at this point. And American customers that participated in this survey said time and time again that their primary reason for shopping at Shein over all of these other brands was, you guessed it, price. Now, if you think all of these retailers who are struggling with sales are not reading that study and thinking, we need to figure out how to lower our prices, well, think again. They are definitely trying to get there somehow. And as I talked about last week, that means lower quality stuff for all of us and lower wages for everyone involved in making, shipping, or selling these clothes, whether they work in the factories, the corporate offices, the UPS hub, the stores, or the warehouse. It affects everyone. Furthermore, can we just take a moment to recognize that selling dresses for $10 or $5 or $2.20 devalues clothing as a whole because suddenly we because we've been zoning out on that rainbow wallpaper for too long we start to think that the correct and reasonable price for a dress is ten dollars or five dollars or two dollars and twenty cents and we want all brands and designers to sell them for that price even small businesses and if a brand new dress is two dollars and twenty cents or five dollars or ten dollars Well, then a secondhand one needs to be like $1. So we also think secondhand resellers and thrift stores are price gouging us too. And because these clothes are so cheap, we expect to wear them for a brief period of time, only to be replaced again soon. One thing that was interesting about that UBS report was that she and customers were spending about $100 a month on clothing, which at first I was like, that's not really that much clothing. Like that could be, if you're buying nicer stuff, maybe two things a month, that's 24 things in a year. To me, that's not egregious, right? But then I went on Shein. (laughs) 
today. And my thoughts started to change on that. Like based on the kind of prices I was seeing, that can mean 10 dresses each month or 20 dresses each month or God forbid, roughly 50 dresses each month, kind of like depending on the prices. And no one needs that many of anything every single month. So suddenly, before I was like $100, whatevs, now I'm like, oh my God, this is a big deal. That's a lot of clothes. It's easy to buy this much stuff when the prices are really that low, even if it is unnaturally and unethically so. Last week, we talked about some of the reasons that Shein can offer these unnaturally low prices. They don't pay duties. They don't have warehouses. Another big reason that Shein can offer those low, low, like too low to be true prices is that the company has lower overhead expenses. One of the reasons is that it doesn't have a team of designers to create the 6,000 styles it launches on its site every day. I mean, Imagine the massive team of buyers and designers and technical designers and production people that would be required to put together 6,000, okay, not even great, just kind of like it'll fit somebody styles to launch every single day. That's almost 2.2 million new styles every year. And anyone who has ever worked in corporate design or production is like gasping right now because there's just no way unless you have about like 10,000 employees just working on product development and design and production. But Sheehan says it has about 10,000 employees worldwide. And those people are most likely working on marketing, accounting, clerical stuff, website stuff, photography, product copies, social media, and so much more. Sheehan doesn't have an army of people creating this product. It also doesn't have the salaries and the offices and the equipment, et cetera, for that army of staff working on those designs. Because why? Because the artificially low prices of Shein can't cover that. Right away, if Shein actually had people designing and fitting and just like producing this product from, in a, from a corporate perspective, prices would go up. They'd probably double immediately. So the pricing doesn't work for that, Right. That's how Shein ends up stealing so much work from artists and smaller brands all over the world. Google copied by Shein, and well, get ready to spend a whole day reading about it. I'll share a few links for you to check out in the show notes, but rest assured, Shein is stealing designs every day from lots of small businesses out there. Copying and stealing designs from smaller brands and artists has become a common practice in fast fashion, and we've talked about it a ton here in the past. But Shein takes it to the next level because it needs even more new stuff to sell every day. And furthermore, the company rarely faces legal or financial repercussions thanks to its complex organization of shell companies. We'll talk about that later in this episode. Instead, Shein uses data from customers and from around the internet to capture styles that customers will want to buy. Um, There's a Reuters piece. I'll share it in the show notes. It's called Shein's Fast Fashion Comes with Fast Finance Risks. At first glance, Shein looks just like an online retailer, but that's deceptive because the company really trades data. It gathers information on how consumers browse and what flicks their switches. Gross. I hate that saying. It then serves up that information to around 5,000 manufacturers who can create small batch products sold on Shein's platform. I feel like this was a pretty glowing positive spin on that, but as some recent lawsuits explain, Shein is using more than just consumer data to create products. They allege that Shein is using a combination of AI and a powerful algorithm to scour the internet for designs and art that are receiving attention from potential customers. A lawsuit filed last year by three independent designers and artists, Krista Perry, Larissa Martinez, and Jay Barron, that lawsuit cites Shein's practice of producing, distributing, and selling exact copies of their creative works which the lawsuit alleges is part and parcel of Sheehan's design process and organizational DNA. In other words, Sheehan only works if it's stealing stuff from artists, right? Like, and it's, it's part of the plan. It's not an accident. It's not a coincidence. 
The lawsuit goes on to say, Sheehan's design algorithm could not work without generating the kinds of exact copies that can greatly damage an independent designer's career, especially because Sheehan's artificial intelligence is smart enough to misappropriate the pieces with the greatest commercial potential. Meaning, Sheehan's algorithm knows how to pick the best-selling things to copy. A different lawsuit filed this year by artist Alan Gianna explains it well. Sheehan does not create many of its products. It certainly does not design thousands daily. Instead, it uses sophisticated electronic systems that algorithmically scour the internet for popular works created by artists. It then misappropriates those works to manufacture and sell as Sheehan's own products without notice or attribution to the artists and creators. Sheehan uses algorithms, artificial intelligence, and related computerized monitoring systems to identify trending and viral images and designs on social media, apps, and websites. It steals those images and designs from their owners, many of whom are innocent creators who support themselves through creative work. Widespread copyright infringement is baked into the business. And I want to be clear, because this sounds like sci-fi fantasy or AI doomerism, I want to be clear that technology that scours the internet for designs to copy does exist, and it's been around for a while. That's why we see so many knockoff tees all over the place. Technology that I cannot possibly understand, but I know bots are involved, looks for images that receive a lot of positive feedback, like comments and likes on social media platforms, and then it copies them. It's a regular occurrence in the world of t-shirts and other printable art. A few years ago, here on the podcast, I talked about a 2019 BBC piece that discussed how artists were finding that their art was being stolen by bots via Twitter. I'll share that in the show notes. That was 2019. So we know the technology has been around for quite a while. There is no doubt that Shein is using it because to create 6,000 new styles every day, They would also need an army of people just trolling the internet for things to copy. So it's definitely technology-based. This excerpt from Gianna's lawsuit explains it a little bit better. After scraping data from non-Shean sources to identify relevant trends, Shean purportedly uses its algorithms to identify products for Shean suppliers to manufacture. Sheehan then automatically sends orders for the requested products to one or more of Sheehan's legions of suppliers, adjusting production demands based on the traction that the product gets with Sheehan's customer base. Meaning, if it sells, they will make a lot more and they will keep making whatever that is, that's stolen design, until it doesn't sell anymore or they get caught. The thing is, this is happening nonstop, and it has been happening nonstop for years now. There's this 2022 Wall Street Journal investigation called China's fast fashion giant Xi'an faces dozens of lawsuits alleging design theft. And that revealed that in the previous three years, so 2019 to 2022, there had been more than 50 lawsuits filed by big companies in the U.S. against Sheehan for copyright infringement. We're not even talking about all of the artists and makers and small brands that were copied and couldn't afford a lawyer. We're talking about brands, big brands with a budget, with a legal team taking she into court. And it's like such a diverse list of brands. It really does speak to the almost like random, but also strategic and also super hyper thorough nature of the technology that Shein is using to copy things. It also points to no one even stopping to look at these things and saying, that's a bad idea. Like no one, no human is stepping in and saying, maybe we shouldn't do that one. We're going to get caught. The range of companies, like I said, is huge. There's Ralph Lauren. There's the sunglasses brand Oakley. There's Stussy, who discovered that Shein was not only stealing its art, but also literally selling shirts that said Stussy on them, which Right there to me, I'm like, this proves that no person is even checking these things. It's just like happening. 
Who else? Nirvana. Yeah, the band Nirvana. Sheehan was selling knockoff Nirvana tees um, for Love and Lemons, H&M. I mean, these are just the bigger brands who were filing lawsuits, but like so many more artists struggled and couldn't do anything about it. That said, Sheehan gets this bad press. There's some lawsuits, but Sheehan doesn't stop what it's doing. Why? Because it gets away with it. Sheehan generally gets away with this unethical behavior for several reasons. First off, the artist or designer actually has to know that they were copied. And unless they or their customers are checking Sheehan every day, they might miss it. Who has time every day to see if the latest 6,000 styles are anything copied off of you? No one has time for that. And Sheehan's Byzantine corporate structure makes it difficult to take legal action. I promise we're getting to that. Furthermore, Sheehan usually order, only orders about 200 units of a new item. In contrast, a standard fast fashion retailer would order 1,000 to 10,000 units or even more in an initial order. Well, why does Sheehan order so little? We're talking about this like mega billion dollar company. Why would they only order 200 units? Well, it allows them to test the legal waters. If an artist or designer or brand discovers the stolen design, Sheehan can settle cheaply and fast with little financial loss. I read one article where a woman was talking about how her art had been copied on a t-shirt. She reached out to Sheehan. They were like, okay, we're going to pull the t-shirt. Uh, we only made $40 in profit off of it. Here's your $40. So for Sheehan, the risk is minimal. But now this artist, well, now she people might think that she stole the art from Sheehan. Furthermore, this small quantity allows Sheehan to claim it was like a blip in the system. Often Sheehan will say that a third-party partner was responsible for the mistake, which allows them to avoid accountability from both the designer and its customer base. And that woman who was paid $40, they were like, oh, sorry, you know, we just bought that on the market, in the clothing market. We didn't know, like, it was their fault. Well, Sheehan doesn't buy clothes that way. So that was just a lie. But beyond all of that, it's really fucking hard and expensive to win a lawsuit like this, especially if you're a small business. And it's even harder to fight Sheehan. Designers and artists are generally unable to do very much about Sheehan's intellectual property theft. Like, if the designer can afford a lawyer, and that is such a big if, they might be able to negotiate a settlement. They might get $40, <laughs> but more often than not, nothing really happens other than Sheehan pulling the item off the website. Furthermore, if there's no pushback from the creator of the design and customers like the product, Sheehan will order many more units. When customers buy copies and knockoffs, they're actually signaling Sheehan to continue copying. And I want you to remember that. That's how... She and, and any other retailer works. They don't even care if the internet's mad at them. If the sales keep happening, they will continue to make more. And that's a problem because often when an idea or design or art enters the knockoff cycle via Shein, it's just the first step of a long, uncontrollable chain of copies that move through progressively less reputable brands, ultimately living on Amazon or AliExpress for years. I've seen it happen so many times over the past few years. This robs the original creator of ownership and often decreases the value of their original work. This can end the business completely or force them to find a different direction. I just want to get down to brass tacks for a minute here. Copying artists and designers and smaller brands is an incredibly unethical act that is often overlooked or excused by customers who are happy to find a deal. But I want to be clear. Sheehan isn't doing you a favor by creating a cheap knockoff of something you like. They're just profiting from unethical behavior. And one thing I never cease to be amazed by that really, really makes me sad, honestly, definitely sends me into an anxiety spiral, is one, people's willingness to be totally chill with dupes of stuff 
And two, and this is even more upsetting, and sometimes it makes me lose my faith in humanity, how many people show up to say it's the artist's or designer or brand's fault in the first place for being copied, maybe because they charge too much, as if there is anything logical about Shein's pricing. No, no small brand could ever charge what Shein's charging because probably, no, not probably, definitely making that item costs more than Shein is charging for the knockoff, okay? Earlier this year, one of you sent me a post from a business called A. Marie A. Creates. She makes all kinds of cute, vintage-inspired graphic stuff. And she discovered that some of her art and product had been directly copied by a company making stuff using the Cupcakes and Cashmere brand name. And it was for sale at TJ Maxx, and I think other people saw it at Marshall's. Cupcakes and Cashmere is an influencer. I can't remember her name right now, but she's been around for a long time. We did some work with her at Mod Cloth. Um, my guess here is that she was not involved with creating this product at all, but probably licenses out her name to someone who makes this stuff for TJ Maxx. What shocked me most about this wasn't the copying itself or how the influencer behind Cupcakes and Cashmere didn't take accountability. It was how many people in the comments were blaming her, the artist, Ashley, for getting copied in the first place. They said it was her fault for not copywriting her work. By the way, from a legal perspective, graphic art like that is protected legally as long as she has a demonstrable trail of evidence showing that she created it. She probably can't afford to get that stuff copyrighted. And furthermore, as far as I know, she never saw a lawyer and went after TJ Maxx or Cupcakes and Cashmere because no small brand can afford that, okay? This is how brands get away with it. Furthermore, people were saying that like she should be flattered, that she should be glad for the attention, or maybe she was doing this for the attention. There were a lot of people showing up to say like, so what if someone copies your work, maybe come up with something more original. I mean, people were being really horrible and it really... It made me so sad and angry and frustrated. And yeah, I, I there was a day or two where I was like, man, I, sometimes I just feel like so hopeless because who is there stepping up to protect TJ Maxx? You know, like we're talking about a real person here whose business supports her children. And we're here saying like, it's your fault. I hate this. I want to be clear that knockoffs like this, whether it's Shein or Cupcakes and Cashmere, They destroy small businesses because now the artist has lost ownership of their work. People assume it was designed by Shein or Cupcakes and Cashmere. The artist might even be accused of copying Shein. And you know what? This is a small business killer. You might feel that that Shein knockoff of a Selkie dress is cheaper and it's your right to have a cheaper version. But is it? Are you cool with all of the other small brands you love eventually going away because they can't keep going because everyone is giving their money to Shein instead? We all lose out when companies steal from artists. The world gets a lot less interesting. Sometimes I get really deep into my head about these kinds of things, and I can't help but see how stealing from artists and designers and creators only exacerbates wealth inequality. How? Well, big companies underpay their workers so they can't afford the prices fairly asked by small businesses. Then the big companies like Shein knock off the small business and sell the copy to those underpaid workers. Small businesses lose out and big businesses continue to stack profits made possible by low wages and stolen creativity. Eventually, these small businesses close up shop and... Maybe they go work in an Amazon warehouse or for one of these companies. You know, I always say that I'm going to side-eye everyone when all of the creative people, including myself, have to go work at the Amazon warehouse because AI took all of our jobs. Uh, I'm going to feel the same way when all of the makers and designers and artists are working alongside me at Amazon because she installed their designs and everyone went and bought them and drove them out of business. Like... Protecting artists and designers is a matter of economic justice. The good news is like there are things you can do to help and they're not actually hard at all. First off, 
don't buy the copy. The main reason Shein and other fast fashion brands continue to dupe designs and arts from smaller brands is because people continue to buy them. Just don't buy it. That's the easiest part, right? Let the small business know that you saw the copy and screenshots are a great idea. Like I said, especially if we're talking about Shein here, who has time to go look to see if their art was stolen by Shein? Be loud about it. Post in your stories, comment on posts from the big brand, tell anyone who will listen. Tweet, email, and DM the big brand doing the copying. Encourage others to do the same. And support that small brand. That doesn't have to mean buying anything if you can't afford it. Share their content, recommend them to others, and leave product reviews. If you're enjoying this episode, then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at Close Horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you, just like NPR, and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. Blank Cass, or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles by embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. New Vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. Country Feedback is a mom and pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns. Handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed. Made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand dyed yarns and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand knit, crocheted or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at Republica underscore Unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnic Wear, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnic Wear in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnic Wear recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic Wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. 
Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. Is there a little bit of Italy in your soul? Are you an enthusiast of pre-loved decor and accessories? Bring vintage Italian style and history into your space with the pewter thimble. We source useful and beautiful things and mend them where needed. We also find gorgeous illustrations and make them print worthy. Tarot cards, tea towels, and hand-picked treasures available to you from the comfort of your own home. Responsibly sourced from across Rome, lovingly renewed by fairly paid artists and artisans, with something for every budget. Discover more at thepewterthimble.com. Deco Denim is a startup based out of San Francisco, and it sells clothing and accessories that are sustainable, gender fluid, size inclusive, and high quality, made to last for years to come. Deco Denim is trying to change the way you think about buying clothes. Founder Sarah Mattis wants to empower people to ask important questions like, where was this made? Was this garment made ethically? Is this fabric made of plastic? Can this garment be upcycled? And if not, can it be recycled? Sign up at decodenim.com to receive $20 off your first purchase. They promise not to spam you and send out no more than three emails a month, with two of them surrounding education or a personal note from the founder. Again, that's decodenim.com. But back to Sheehan, all of those lawsuits aren't really going anywhere because it's really impossible to hold Sheehan accountable from a legal perspective. Its headquarters are in Singapore, but, well, it's a lot more complicated than that. Sheehan seems like a big monolithic company to customers, right? Like there's probably just this huge building and it says Sheehan on it and everyone works in there and that's that. But it's actually a collective of shell companies and holding groups based all around the world in what one of the lawsuits filed a couple years ago calls a Byzantine shell game of a corporate structure. It's really hard to figure out who who to hold accountable thanks to this structure, which is is not an accident. Okay, this is this was planned. This confusing structure allows Sheehan to avoid a lot of responsibilities. One is taxes and duties. No clear central hub in one specific country allows Sheehan to avoid a lot of taxes. And yes, that saves them a lot of money. One more reason that it is able to offer these unnaturally low prices. The structure also allows Sheehan to skirt issues of labor safety and wage theft. If it's unclear who is responsible for a factory or product, government agencies cannot hold anyone accountable or force change. And often between any Sheehan facility and actual like Sheehan, there are many shell companies and organizations in between. So it's really hard to trace it back to Sheehan. Furthermore, all of this allows Sheehan to get away with a lot of sketchy business practices. Tracking down a defendant for any lawsuit is nearly impossible. You might think you're suing Sheehan, but this is so complicated that you actually need to file your lawsuit like against some other company, like seven companies deep. Often cases cannot move forward. If you've discovered that Sheehan has stolen in your art or designs, well, you know what? Good luck holding someone responsible. What you'll actually be doing is spending a lot of money paying a lawyer to try to find someone to serve with a cease and desist. It's also an issue of customer safety. If you find lead in your Sheehan clothing or get injured or sick from something you bought from them, oh well, there's no one to hold responsible. Okay, wait, am I being so melodramatic right now? Like, how could you get sick or injured from Sheehan's clothing? I mean, it's clothing, right? Well, remember the last episode when we talked about how the path Sheehan product takes from the factory to the customer is really different? For fast fashion and unfast fashion, the path was always and remains, no matter how fast it is, factory, then airplane or boat, in this time, probably airplane, 
then a truck, then a warehouse, then the store or the customer. Sheehan cuts that process down to factory, airplane, customer. Well, when we think of the standard fast fashion process, we see a lot of places where quality or safety issues could be caught. First, before this product is even made, the production team is going to be ensuring that suppliers conduct any safety certifications required by U.S. law and those required by the company to minimize any future lawsuits. We're talking about things like flammability tests. Yes, I have had products fail that, many of them scarves. We're talking about lead levels and so many other tests. But also an item's path to the customer will have multiple points where issues like this could be caught before reaching the customer. First off, it would be passing through customs where any major safety issues would be spotted. Next, it would arrive at the warehouse where the staff would unpack it and recognize any larger quality or safety issues. Then it would arrive in the stores where more people would unpack it and could spot any egregious concerns. And so by the time it gets into a customer's hands, most big issues would have been caught. Sheehan doesn't have any of that. There's no design and production team to manage safety testing. There's no customs inspection thanks to the de minimis loophole. There's no warehouse. There's no stores. And yeah, that means unsafe product makes its way to customers. Man, I just have to take a moment here to tell you that we're having a crazy heat wave right now um, on the East Coast. Um, It's in the high 90s outside right now. And because I'm recording, I can't have the air conditioner on. I'm like drenched with sweat right now. Things are starting to get psychedelic, Uh, but we don't have that much more to talk about. So anyway, I was telling Dustin this week that like between copyright infringement lawsuits and time Shein products were discovered to contain dangerous chemicals, Well, this series could be like six months long if I covered all of them. Because it turns out, Shein isn't doing a great job of checking the stuff they sell for toxic chemicals. A 2021 investigation by CBC Marketplace found that a toddler's jacket purchased from Shein contained almost 20 times the amount of lead that Health Canada says is safe for children. A purse from Shein had more than five times the threshold. Here's just like an excerpt from this piece. Lead is a naturally occurring element that can be found throughout the environment, but Joel Mertens, a product environmental impacts expert at the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, said the levels found in Marketplace's lab results were beyond environmental contamination or the small amount clothes are exposed to unintentionally during the manufacturing process. There were clearly products that were intentionally using lead and intentionally using it in a way that was well above what should be considered responsible or even safe, he said. I thought this was a pretty uh, interesting perspective on this, like this idea that the factories making these products knew that they were making something dangerous, but still continued to do so. And of course, Shein isn't going to catch it because they're not ever taking ownership of the product, right? It's shipping right from the factory. I guess they probably received a sample to photograph for their website, but that would be about it. And who knows, maybe they're not even doing that. So these factories can kind of do like whatever they want unless they get caught. And even then, like, I don't know if Shein holds them accountable. Environmental chemist Miriam Diamond, who oversaw the testing conducted by CBC Marketplace said, This is hazardous waste. I'm alarmed because we're buying what looks cute and fashionable on this incredibly short fashion cycle. What we're doing today is to look for very short-lived enjoyment out of some articles of clothing that cost so much in terms of our future health and environmental health. That cost is not worth it. I agree. I mean, I think that's a lot of what's happening with this Shein stuff. It's instant, easy gratification We know that the things that we buy from Shein, we're not going to have them for a long time. You can't buy a $2.20 dress and expect that you're going to wear it for the next 10 years. And by signing on to these, these prices that we know, we know in the back of our minds, right? We know that they don't make sense. They don't add up. We know we're not going to get something great, but we're saying like, I need it. I need it now, right? And that's probably because we feel a lot of pressure to need it. And that's something that we have to work on within ourselves, but also as a community, as a society, right? Like we need to reboot, dismantle 
the pressure to have all of these clothes and have so many of them so fast and for such a brief window of time. Okay, so that was 2021. A 2022 Greenpeace Germany report called Taking the Shine Off of Shein found that of 47 Shein products tested, 15% of them contained hazardous chemicals that exceeded EU regulatory limits. And I just want to say, they tested 47 products. Shein has 600,000 products on its site at any given moment, right? If we extrapolated that in this Greenpeace Germany investigation, where 15% of the products tested contained hazardous chemicals, if we assume that then 15% of all the products sold by Shein contained hazardous chemicals, and that's not perfect science here, but if we just explored that idea, that would mean that right now on its website, Shein has 90,000 items for sale that contain hazardous chemicals that would exceed EU regulatory limits. What they found in this report is that they found seven products containing 100 to 685 times the level of phthalates permitted under EU regulations. There was a baby's tutu that had formaldehyde levels about four times the level permitted under EU regulations. And even low levels of formaldehyde can cause irritation of the eyes, nose, and throat. Long-term exposure can cause certain cancers. There was a red pair of stiletto boots that had three times the level of nickel permitted under EU regulations. Short-term nickel exposure can cause skin irritation. Long-term exposure can cause certain cancers. Even worse, these items are not intended to be worn or used for very long, as we've discussed. When they inevitably end up in landfills, these chemicals will leach into the soil and water, causing health effects for anyone living near these facilities. And you know what else? They are likely causing health issues for the people working in the factories making this stuff and the people and animals living around these factories. I want to read you an excerpt from Greenpeace Germany's press release about this report. Greenpeace Germany's findings show that the use of hazardous chemicals underpins Shein's ultra-fast fashion business model, which is the opposite of being future-proof. Shein products containing hazardous chemicals are flooding European markets and breaking regulations, which are not being enforced by the authorities. But it's the workers in Shein's suppliers, the people in surrounding communities, and the environment in China that bear the brunt of Shein's hazardous chemical addiction. At its core, the linear business model of fast fashion is totally incompatible with a climate-friendly future. But the emergence of ultra-fast fashion is further accelerating the climate and environmental catastrophe and must be stopped in its tracks through binding legislation. Alternatives to buying new must become the norm. And that last sentence is key. I hate that so many of us live in a binary of Shein or nothing, or at least that's how it feels in these online conversations about Shein. Ultimately, we all deserve so much better than Shein, and we won't get anything better until we stop buying this stuff. That doesn't mean we walk around naked. It means that we buy less new stuff in the first place. We make our clothes last via care and repair, and we shop secondhand first whenever possible. I got last week's episode started by talking about how short-sighted the CEOs of all of these fast fashion brands are, because rather than thinking about the long-term longevity of their brands, which would mean making them more sustainable and ethical and making higher quality product, they are instead thinking only about the short term and profits and loss right now. And so they're trying to chase Shein, right, in terms of pricing and product offering and all of that. I will also say that Shein is being very short-sighted because you can only sell so many clothes to people and you can only sell so many clothes to people that you have gradually killed with your stuff, right? Like surely the founder of Shein has a family 
um, maybe not children of his own or maybe, but knows other children and knows people whose children will have children and their children will have children. And here's the thing. There's not going to be a good place left for all of them to live if Sheehan continues to grow and operate this way. And that is just like the peak, the peak of short-sightedness. But I would also like us to think about how maybe short-sighted we are sometimes by continuing to buy this stuff. That doesn't mean you're a bad person if you do. Once again, I, I understand that for many people, Sheehan really is the best option right now. Unfortunately, it's a terrible option. So if you need things, like literally need them, not just want them, and you can only get them from Shein, then get them. But don't buy a ton of it. Don't buy a haul. Don't buy 10 or 20 or 50 dresses from Shein in a month. Buy what you need and that's it. And I think this idea that there's just this binary that it's either Shein or nothing and we're all mad about it and we're fighting about it on the internet. It's because we're all dancing around the real thing that needs to happen here, which is that we all need to buy less new stuff. And that's not exciting or as fun as it sounds on the surface level. But I will say there's a lot of fun to be having by making our clothes last, right? By wearing things we love, by shopping secondhand and and so much more. We gotta We gotta distance ourselves from this like, it's either Shein or nothing at all vibe that just seems to permeate the internet when we have conversations about Shein. Okay, I've shown you examples of Shein products being dangerous in 2021 and 2022. Let's jump forward to this year, just a few weeks ago. Authorities in Seoul, South Korea have been conducting weekly testing and inspection of Shein products for toxic chemicals and other health and safety issues. They choose a few items each week at random. Recently, a test of eight products, eight out of the 600,000 on the site, so just a little tiny drop right there, uh, that test revealed that one pair of shoes contained 428 times the permitted level of phthalates, the highest observed so far for the sole inspections, and three bags had amounts as high as 153 times the limit. Phthalates, by the way, are hormone disruptors linked to heart disease, fertility issues, and some types of cancer. So far, authorities in Seoul have tested 93 products, and they found that almost half, half of them contain toxic substances, including children's watches and coloring pencils. And so then if we said, okay, Seoul's testing experience is representative of the total Shein product assortment, and Seoul has found that half had toxic levels of chemicals. Okay, does that mean then that half of Shein's 600,000 products on their site right now, aka 300,000, they have toxic levels of chemicals? I don't know. But all these numbers seem tiny until you think about the scale of the Shein business model. And you got to remember that Shein launches those 6,000 new products every day, and only a tiny percentage are being tested and inspected by governments, news outlets, and organizations. We have to think about how many are being missed. So what happens if your Shein item gives you a rash or makes you sick? Who protects you? Well, if governments find toxic chemicals in a Shein product, there's not very much they can do other than seize those specific products. It is very difficult to hold Shein legally responsible because they have no clear central business hub, as we discussed. If you get sick or injured from a Shein item, you won't have much luck with a lawsuit or getting them to cover your medical bills. If an item from a regular fast fashion brand like, say, Zara made you sick, you could sue them or even be part of a class action lawsuit. As I mentioned earlier, in my experience working as a buyer in fast fashion, We only use materials that have been tested for flammability and high levels of toxic chemicals due to both government regulations and fear of being sued. Yeah, sometimes the fear of being sued is enough to get companies to make stuff that won't kill you. Funny how that works. And beyond that, if workers in the factories making this stuff for Shein get sick or injured, remember, they're being exposed to these chemicals in a bigger way, 
They don't have a lot of legal recourse either because Sheehan's corporate structure makes it difficult for any governing body to hold them accountable. So here's a summary of what we've talked about this week because we're coming down the home stretch. Soon I'm gonna get to turn the air conditioning on again. I'm probably gonna have to change clothes. Like that's how sweaty I am. Okay, Sheehan's prices are unnaturally low. If they do become a publicly traded company, that will probably change because they're getting away with a lot of stuff that is very illegal and unethical because of their weird company structure. It's hard to hold them accountable, whether they steal your art or make you sick. But every other brand out there is going to continue to try to compete with Shein on pricing. The spoiler is that they can't. So they will be making even crappier clothes, squeezing factories on pricing, and underpaying and overworking everyone involved with making, shipping, and selling those clothes to us. Furthermore, These low prices are creating an environmental and economic disaster as we cycle through clothes faster and faster and people are paid less and less to make them. And Shein is obliterating small businesses around the world by stealing their art and undercutting them on price. I've said it before and I'll say it again. All of us, no matter where we live, what we wear, or what we do for a living, we are already experiencing the repercussions of fast fashion. There's the microplastics in the water, in the soil, in the food supply. There's water scarcity, the impact of carbon emissions, the suppression of wages, and like I always say, the emotionally corrosive nature of a steady stream of low-quality, poor-fitting clothing. Seriously, it makes us feel bad mentally. When you break up with it, you actually feel better, way better than you did when you got that package in the mail. It's like fascinating how that works, and I say that as a person who has experienced it firsthand. All of this, it will get worse as Shein becomes the standard for making and selling clothing. So we have to talk about Shein often to everyone we know because this is really happening. We can't pretend things are different over there or it doesn't really matter or my impact isn't as big as Amazon's or the government will fix it or anything else like that. We have to talk about it. And I know that this is not easy because there's a lot of scary information competing for attention with low prices and infinite selection and she and hall posts on every platform. But we can do it. It doesn't have to be judgy or blamey. It just needs to be honest. So get your friends to listen to these episodes or tell them what you've learned. We might think that everyone knows about Shein, but as I've learned while working on the Fashion Act, Many people outside our bubble, they have no idea. So let's talk to them about Shein. Thanks for listening to another episode of Clothes Horse. Written, researched, hosted, all the things, including so much sweat, by me, Amanda Lee McCarty. You know, I received an email this week asking me like, hey, listen, I can't support Clothes Horse financially. Um, Is there a place I could listen to Clothes Horse where you're gonna get paid for the streams? And I'm going to tell you right now, there is not, whether you listen to this on Spotify or Apple or some other listening place, (laughs) whatever that's called, uh, I don't get paid for it. No, most podcasters do not, unless they allow those services to put their own ads into the episode, which I I don't feel good about. Um, I know that it can generate thousands of dollars in revenue every month for podcasters, but it doesn't feel right to me and you have no control over what shows up. And imagine if you're listening to Close Horse and you get an ad for Shein, that'd be really messed up, right? So what can you do if you cannot support Close Horse financially? Well, you can leave a rating, you can leave a review, you can subscribe. These things help. You can tell your friends, you can share my content on social media, you can recommend me to do a speaking thing for your library or your local environmental group or what have you. Um, These are all ways that you can help me and you don't have to spend a dime to do any of them and they're all really valuable. If you do want to support my work financially, you can learn more at patreon.com slash clothes horse podcast, or you can buy me a Kofi, which you can put in any amount you want. You can give me $3, you can give me $20. It's a one-time thing. You can find that in the show notes uh, at my website, clotheshorsepodcast.com, or in the link tree on my profile on Instagram. Ooh, it's really hot. Okay, thank you again for listening. And of course, thank you to Dustin Travis White for our music and our audio support. And I will be back next week. Bye. Bye.